She turned toward him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni. This means teacher. Do not hold on to me. Because I have not yet gone back up to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to him who is my father and their father. My God and their God. All right, well, we, uh, we are in the Gospel of John, as I said, and I do have a handout. I'm going to start this over here. Matt, can I give this to you? Sure, absolutely. We've been working our way through the Gospel of John, and we're almost to the end. So excited about finishing and seeing what the Lord has next for us. So we are in chapter 20, and a handout is coming around that will uh, have an outline for you and some other information regarding what we'll go over today. Uh, we've looked in the past several weeks at the crucifixion of Christ, his trial, his burial, and today we move into chapter 20 looking at the resurrection of Christ and seeing specifically through the lens of Mary Magdalene what takes place. Uh, so I'm excited about what we'll learn together as we go through. So uh, as the handout comes around, you can follow along as I read or in your translation. I'm beginning in chapter 20, verse 1, reading down through 18. So you can follow along as I read. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark and saw the stone taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out and the other disciple and they headed toward the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped to look in and saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Peter also came following him and went into the tomb, observed the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief which had been on his head was not with the linen cloths lying there, but by itself folded up in one place. So then also the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went inside, saw it, and believed. For they still did not understand the scripture that it was necessary for him to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. Then as she wept, she stooped to look inside the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She replied to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. After she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Since she thought that he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and reported to the disciples that I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. So last week we spent some time looking at uh, some of the literary techniques that the Apostle John uses in crafting together this narrative of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And specifically we saw that Mary Magdalene, who is introduced to us here in the first verse, is really integral to the rest of the chapter. She's the key character that John uses to introduce all the other major characters. So Mary Magdalene has a very pivotal role, which we'll see is quite significant given the fact that uh, often in this society, women were marginalized from being key witnesses. In fact, they were not allowed to stand trial as witnesses in a court of law. But we find here, interestingly, that Mary becomes pivotal as the first witness to Jesus' resurrection. She's the first to see the resurrected Lord. And in fact, Mary and Thomas function in similar ways. If you were to do a study of Mary, who we find really uh, central in verses 11 through 18, and then Thomas, who's central in verses 24 through verse 29, you'll see that they function really in a similar way. 
And that is to say both uh, begin with certain doubts about what's going to happen that eventually is turned into faith. Both have a desire to see the Lord. We often talk about doubting Thomas, right? That he wants to see the Lord for himself so he can know that Jesus really has risen from the dead. But Mary seems to have the same uh, ambition or drive. She wants to see Jesus. She wants to take his body and give him a proper burial. And both receive a personal revelation from the Lord. First, Mary gets to see Jesus herself. And then Thomas later on gets a personal revelation of Christ. So Mary and Thomas seem to be parallel figures here, and John uses them as key witnesses of the resurrection. And what I think gives hope to us is the fact that both start out skeptical. They start out with doubts and suspicions. Mary seems to cling to this grave robber theory. She seems convinced from the beginning uh, through the middle of the pericope where she appears, this section, she seems convinced that someone has stolen Jesus' body. And only when Jesus appears does that doubt or suspicion turn to faith. And the same thing with Thomas. Thomas wants to see for himself. He wants to be able to validate the resurrection has happened. It's almost like it's too good to be true. He himself wants to observe it, and he does. And so the point, I think, in both of these is that we as readers are to be convinced by these two witnesses. That is to say, if both Mary and Thomas, who were with Jesus for most of his ministry, if not all of it, if they were suspicious and doubtful, but they saw the Lord and that appearance of Jesus moved them to faith, that we too should believe. And that's really the capstone later on in the chapter that John will say when Jesus tells Tom, Blessed are those who have seen, who have not seen, and yet still believed. And that's what we as readers are to do. That is to believe the testimony and to have faith. So that's really, I think, the point where John is going. So let's go through this passage and uh, have some discussion about some of the major points. We saw last week that Mary comes very early while it's still dark to the tomb. And so this is, uh, if you look at astronomical data, it's probably around 5.30 in the morning when she leaves to go to the tomb. And so John focuses on her, but we know that there were other women with her. If we uh, take John's account and silhouette it against the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find that there were several women that went. In fact, it's probably unlikely that Mary Magdalene would go by herself if it was dark because there were a lot of people there for the festival of the Passover and they often just camped and sprawled all over Jerusalem. And so it would be, in some ways, unsafe for a woman by herself to walk in the dark. So it's likely that she's accompanied here by the other women. But John isn't so concerned about the other women. What John often does, and we see him do this throughout the Gospel, is he'll take one character and focus his vision on that one character as a representative of the others. And I think that's what he's doing here. For his purposes, Mary Magdalene represents all the women. And he wants to focus on her and her reaction to Jesus' resurrection as a means of showing how the women collectively reacted. So in verse 2, they, uh, verse 1, it's dark, they leave. She comes upon the tomb and she sees that the stone has been taken away. Now, what does she do at that point? Rather than investigating what maybe has occurred, she immediately seems to turn around and run back to the other disciples. Now again, I think, as I made the point last time, it's interesting that in John's account, the disciples who should be leading the charge here, right? If the apostles are truly faithful to Christ, and particularly uh, we think of Peter who was ready to die for Jesus. He had his sword out. He chopped off the ear of the servant of the high official, and so he's ready to give his life for Jesus, but now he seems to be hiding somewhere, and it's Mary and the women who are coming to the tomb. Just like it's Joseph and Nicodemus who bury Jesus, they were the, the cowardly disciples of the Sanhedrin who were afraid for most of Jesus' ministry, and now they're taking courage. And now the women are taking courage, but she runs back to talk to Simon Peter, and then in verse 2, to this other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Now we've identified this disciple before. Uh, who, who do we probably think that this disciple is, the one whom Jesus loved? John. 
Now, why does he always refer to himself in this way rather than identifying himself? Okay. Yeah, there's, there's probably some, some humility in the sense that uh, he's not really worthy to mention himself or put himself in the spotlight. In other words, even how he characterizes himself is not something he did, but something that Jesus did. So in other words, he's saying, there's, there's nothing about me that's worthy of a claim. I'm simply the one that Jesus loved, and that's all you need to know about me. And so it's probably John, and whenever we see this other disciple, it always has the feel of a first-hand account. We see we're, we're privileged to, to inner thoughts and, and different things that are going on. And so it, it seems to have the ring of authenticity that this is the writer of the gospel. This is John. What's also interesting is that John is always seemingly, or often seemingly, paired with Peter. It's not that necessarily, uh, some have gone too far, I think, and I've read this in commentaries that, uh, John feels a need to authenticate himself. So whenever Peter is there, John inserts himself into the story because there's some competition and he wants to draw some of the spotlight away from Peter onto himself to show that he has validity too as a disciple. And I think that's probably uh, obviously reading too much into the story. If anything, I think uh, John is, is diminishing his, his role but he's often there with Peter, and the contrast between the two often gives us a fuller picture, I think, to what the disciples are thinking and doing. Uh, we, we might think of it this way, and this is how I often do, that uh, Peter is the extrovert, right? He's ready to fight. He's brash and bold. He's prone to stick his foot in his mouth. He's prone to say things. Whatever comes into his mind, he just speaks it. And so Peter is always front and center. He's ready to go. In fact, He's the first one, as we see here, he bolts out the door, he's running. John, on the other hand, seems a little more reserved, diffident, that he is a little more introspective, quiet, the introvert. He's more thoughtful, perhaps, or uh, contemplative about what's going on. And so between the two of them, we can kind of see the range of reactions to Jesus, and we can probably find a place where you or I might fit. More, we're more like Peter, perhaps, or more like John. And so we see both these disciples react, and they go out. They're running now, verse 3, to find what's gone on at the tomb. Now, uh, a lot of people like to joke about this because verse 4, uh, Peter gets outrun by John, and it seems to be a foot race. And so some have speculated that uh, perhaps Peter's out of shape, and he's a little older, and he can't quite get to the tomb as fast as John. Uh, we don't obviously know if that's the case. Maybe John takes a shortcut, or he just knows the way better. But in any case, he gets there first. And so he's eager to see this, this theory that Mary seems to suggest that the body's been stolen. So then we encounter them both at the door. So they observe the empty tomb. And again, John, I think, gives us an eyewitness account. They get there. And the other disciple, that is John, stops at the door. He looks in and he sees the linen cloths lying there. Verse 5. Peter comes and what does he do? He bursts into the tomb. Now again, why? Probably I think this reflects their personalities somewhat. That John sees this and he's immediately thinking, what does this mean? He, he's thinking this over, ruminating it in his mind. Whereas Peter gets there and he wants to see and be there and touch it and feel it and figure out what's going on. So Peter bursts in, verse 6. But what's interesting here is John, I think, wants us to see something in particular because he mentions the identical same phrase twice or, or relatively the identical phrase. He almost, John does this a lot where he'll repeat, a, he'll say one phrase and then he'll say it another way, slightly different, but the same meaning to kind of catch our attention. And so in verses 5 and 6, he does this with the linen cloths. If you look at verse 5, John sees the linen cloths lying there. Simon Peter comes, he goes into the tomb, and he sees the linen cloths lying there. It's the same words in a slightly different order in the Greek. But the concept is the same. And then he mentions as well, he sees the face cloth or the handkerchief, which had been on his head. And it's 
thought that perhaps this is a cloth uh, similar to a, a large handkerchief, a hand towel, or something that would be used to tie the jaw to the face uh, for burial so that the, the mouth would be closed. That's what some surmise is the purpose of this. In any event, John mentions twice here the linen cloths and then the face cloth. And so it seems whenever we have repetition such as this, that John is hinting there's something important in, in this, in what's going on. So I want to spend a moment just to talk about this. Why would John focus on these grave clothes? What do you think is so significant about this that he mentions it twice, and the second time he adds to it by saying it's not just the, the linen cloths that he was wrapped in. You remember how they would embalm the body for burial. It's not simply that, it's also the handkerchief. And more than that, they're not simply in a heap on the floor, but they're folded up. So there's something significant here. So I want to talk a minute about this. Why do you think this is so important to John? Any thoughts? Kathy. Well, if somebody had stolen his body, they would have just taken the whole thing. I don't think they would have taken all the cloths off and them up. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's the first point in my notes as well. That it disproves the grave robber theory, right? Mary is convinced that they've stolen the body, but when they get there, the linen cloths are folded up. What grave robber would do this? In the middle of the night, if they're robbing, and remember, this is a crime for which capital punishment was the sentence. So it's a very serious thing. Uh, and this has been done throughout history. If you ever read... Uh, a Tale of Two Cities by Dickens. He talks about these resurrection men, as they called them back in uh, Victorian England, that would be uh, grave robbers. And so this was a common thing, but it was a very serious crime because for the Jewish people, a proper burial of the deceased loved one was of paramount importance because it, it showed reverence and respect for the dead. So obviously, if everything is folded up, it, it would give the, the appearance that it's not a violent crime but rather a purposeful thing that's taken place. So it would disprove that. All right, any other thoughts? Terry. I had once heard from somebody else that, that the cloth was folded, but the Jewish had a particular uh, way of folding it that identified that it was done by someone who knew how to fold it and that it wasn't placed with the other cloth and that meant something else. But I don't know if it's true or not, but that's just, I've heard it that they had a sp specific way of doing it, like we would fold up a flag or something, that they had a specific yeah, a way. a specific way that they could recognize that, like a Gentile wouldn't know how to do it, but a Jewish person would. Okay. But I don't know. It's possible. Uh, yeah. I've heard uh, that in Jewish tradition for dinners, uh, that if you're leaving, you're not coming back, you fold it up. If you're coming back, then you just, throw it down in a haphazard way. So if you're, if you're getting up to come back. So I, I may have somebody make that statement. That would, that would just suggest to me that my kids will never come back to a meal, but they keep showing up. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's a good thought. Um, and, and I think... I only have one source on that, too. Yeah. Well, I, I think my second point here, I think, is along those lines, and that is this, that I think we're hinting, John is hinting here that Jesus has completely mastered death. That is to say, it's complete victory over death. Why would he fold up the grave clothes? I think it suggests here that he's done with them. They're ready for the thrift store. He'll never need them again. And so he folds them up to show he has complete victory over them. Now, some, some have wondered... Uh, when he rose from the dead, did he just pass through the, cl the cloths much as he would pass through walls when he appeared to the disciples? And we don't know, but it would seem, I think, based on how it's configured, that uh, there's more of a deliberate action here. He seems to be deliberately folding them up as if to suggest he's dominated death, he'll never need these again, and so he's setting them aside. It reminds me of Paul's quotation of, Hosea in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Jesus has removed the stinger of death, and so he, he folds up these grave clothes 
uh, as if to suggest he'll never need them. All right, any other thoughts? All right, well, there, there's one other thing that I think is significant, and I want to just draw our attention to it briefly. If you turn back with me to chapter 11, I think the, the final thing that John is doing here is contrasting this scenario with the resurrection of Lazarus. There are a, a number of uh, echoes, I think, in the resurrection account of Jesus that recall to mind things that happened when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. There are both comparisons and contrasts. So beginning in verse 31, I just want to read a few verses here from John 11, verse 31, and I'll read down to verse 45. It says this, When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to, to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, and catch this, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, it's the same word, and his face wrapped with a cloth, again, the same word. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, had come with Mary and seen, had seen what he did, believed in him. Now, I want to spend just a moment going over this because I think what John is suggesting is that there's a radical distinction in Jesus rising from the dead vis-a-vis -vis, or as compared with Lazarus's resuscitation from the dead. And I, th and, and I think we see this both in points of comparison and contrast. So what I'd like to do is work through this together and begin with the points of comparison. Let me say it this way. I think in the two Marys, Mary of Bethany, we'll call her, in chapter 11, that is Lazarus's sister, in Mary of Bethany, and in Mary Magdalene, which we see in chapter 20, there are points of comparison. And we'll look at those to draw those out. When we look at Lazarus and Jesus, there are mainly points of distinction or contrast between Lazarus and Jesus. So let's first start with the comparisons. Okay, we'll, we'll say it this way, Mary versus Mary. Comparison. Okay, so if, if we're studying these two passages and we're being careful readers and looking at both, let's just call out what are some points of comparison. When you look at Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene, what are they both doing that is similar? Weeping. Weeping. All right, so uh, yes, that's a good one. They, Mary is weeping by the grave or she's with those who are weeping. Mary Magdalene is weeping. Any other thoughts? Okay. Okay, right. They're skeptical. So Mary of Bethany says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. And it almost seems like it's a foregone conclusion now. And it seems to be the same thing with Mary Magdalene. She seems to be harboring this idea that his body's been robbed, we don't know where he is, and you know, we have to find his body. She's, she's not really even contemplating the fact that maybe he's risen from the dead, at least at the outset. All right, any other? Points of comparison. We both end up believing. Okay. So we could say they move to belief. Good. They both go from skepticism to belief. 
Any other thoughts? That be love and affection. Okay. Yes, they are fully devoted to the deceased one. They act as if they had missed their opportunity. Okay. Okay, they think of a missed opportunity. All right. Anything else? Yes. Um, Mary of uh, Bethany fell at Jesus' feet. Yep. And Mary of uh, Magdala clung to him in some way. I don't know if it was yeah. his feet or, you know, his mm -hmm. torso. Yeah, that, I, I wrote that down too. I think it's more explicit with Mary of Bethany that she falls at his feet. Uh, in the other account, it's simply Jesus saying, don't cling to me. But if you compare that with Matthew 28, where it says the women fell at his feet and, and held him, I think that's probably the most probable condition, that she's fallen at his feet and she's holding on to his feet. So, uh, yes, I would say that that is a point of comparison. Uh, they fall at the feet and cling to Christ. Okay, good. Anyone else? All right, you'll notice both use the same two titles for Jesus, Lord and Teacher. We see both uh, titles. So they both call Jesus Lord and Teacher. Mary Magdalene uses the word Rabboni, which means my dear teacher. Uh, but John just translates it with the Greek word didaskale, which means teacher. But it's, it's a point of reverence. Uh, so they both make reference to Jesus as teacher. All right, so those are all, uh, I think, important points of comparison uh, that we see in both Marys a similar role. Now when we come to Lazarus and Jesus, to me this is where the contrasts come out. So let's think of... Uh, this as Lazarus versus Jesus contrasts. All right, what are some of the contrasts that we see between Lazarus and Lazarus Jesus? Lazarus still has a linens on his body. I'm sorry, what is it? Lazarus still has a linens on his body. Okay, right. Lazarus is bound. Jesus is not. Isn't it four days versus three days? Yes. Lazarus is four days, Jesus three days. Lazarus had everything done for him, Jesus did everything himself. Okay. The stone had to be rolled away, the claws had to be taken off of him, whereas those were things that Christ did himself. Okay. Charles. Still God the Father that did the raising. Right. Right. Okay. Charles, at you. I was just thinking that Lazarus, he went to glory, but then he had to be pulled back. So I can't imagine what his remaining years, what it, you know, what, uh, because he was able to experience that comparison. And, uh, yeah. Yes. So Lazarus. He was raised back. He was raised in his earthly body. Right. So let's say it this way. He came back from paradise, but he would die again. Okay. So that's why the grave clothes are still there. It seems like the stench of death is still clinging to him. Whereas Jesus came back. You know, he said to the thief there, you'll be with me in paradise today. He came back from paradise in a glorified body. Good. All right, anything else? Let me just point something. Tina was also saying, just to bring this out. Uh, in the Lazarus situation, humans roll the stone away, right? So it says they roll away the stone. Who does it in John 20? Perhaps the angels. It doesn't really say... <laughs> But there's a hint here that it's supernatural. After all, when she looks in, when Mary looks in, she sees angels. So it seems to be 
It's more of a supernatural source. All right, any, any other thoughts? Okay, yes, sir. When Lazarus, the cloths that are taken off, he looks like himself. So he has the same body. And to me, Jesus has a different body because he's not, until he talked, no one recognized him. Mm -hmm. Right. So we don't really know what that is other than he's different in appearance somehow. He has a uh, new body. He's not recognized by the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. He's not recognized by Mary Magdalene initially. But everyone knows who Lazarus is, right? And he comes out. Good. Anything else? Nathan? Um, when Lazarus was kind of resurrected, there were people there watching and seeing it take place, whereas no one was there to witness it. Okay. Okay, here there are witnesses of the resurrection. And there, there are no initial witnesses. Although they come to the picture later on. They don't see it happen. Charles? Well, when the, as far as the angels are concerned, in the book of Matthew, uh, the guards, they witnessed a big portion of it, but not the resurrection, I guess, but... But they were, the Pharisees tried to bribe them and, uh, to make the story like a grave robbing type story. Right. For Jesus yes. versus Where, Lazarus. Like he said, like Lazarus, there is no, <clears throat> everybody saw it. Okay, so we could say for Lazarus, there's no question, whereas here there were conspiracy theories yes. from the very beginning. Because they knew it was at stake. Right, exactly. It, it, was, it was hard to get around this, but this was what they wanted to try to avoid. James, you had thought? Oh, this one about the Roman soldiers. He said there are no witnesses. I mean, the soldiers probably wouldn't have seen inside the tomb as he was physically being resurrected, but they would have seen the immediate aftermath, the you know, stone being rolled away, the earthquake, Christ coming out. So you could view them as a witness to the latter part of the, the miracle itself. Right. Now, of course, there's some question about what, if, what would have happened to them because it would be a capital offense to fail in their duty here. Well, yes, um, they probably would be terribly interested in uh, testifying to what they had seen. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, they would but, seen but there was there was something, obviously, again, supernatural about Jesus' resurrection that seems to just transcend a, a human ability to perceive the actual process taking place. <laughs> Um, all right, good. Any other thoughts? Yes? I don't recollect that we hear much about Lazarus after he's brought back to life, but you just start to get into some of the really good stuff of Jesus after. Okay. Yeah, Lazarus drops off the scene. Jesus uh, really is just getting started, I guess, in some ways. He ascends to the Father. So that might be something of a comparison, but... Um, one other thing, for Lazarus, Jesus has to call him forth, right? So uh, Jesus has to be the agent. Uh, in John 20, we're not told exactly how Jesus rises from the dead. O other places tell us it's through the power of the Spirit, through the working of God. But it seems that Jesus is himself involved somehow in it in a way that's very distinct. Lazarus has no power to regenerate himself, to bring himself to life. Whereas Jesus seems to be in control of the whole situation. He's folded the grave clothes. So it's not like uh, he's just a, a, an involuntary participant, if you will, in this process. All right, so if, if all this is the case, why do you think that John is drawing points of comparison between the Marys and points of comparison between Lazarus and Jesus? So let's kind of tie these loose ends together. What's going on from a literary standpoint in what John is doing? Thoughts? What is John doing here? Is he drawing out the deity of Christ? Okay. Right, he's obviously making a distinction that 
when Jesus rises from the dead, it's utterly distinct from what happened to Lazarus. Lazarus was resuscitated. He'll die again. He's still bound. Jesus raises, rises from the dead in glory, that is to say, in a glorified body. And so there's a marked distinction here so as to highlight the greater of the two. And this is a common technique that writers will do in ancient contexts and in scriptures, is that of showing one character as a foil to the greater character. So you think of uh, David often does this, uh, or functions this way in the Old Testament, that uh, they write about David and all his greatness, but really then he falls short to show how the Messiah will be even better. Or Solomon is very wise, but he falls into idolatry and immorality, and the greater Solomon will be even better. Moses is great, but he can't get into the land. The greater Moses will. And so this is a common thing in, in, in literature of the Bible to show the greater one, and in this case, the greater one is Jesus. Right, Phil, you had a thought? Oh, uh, Similar? I lost it. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> okay, so obviously this is to show Jesus is greater. Why do you think this is here? Why is Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene functioning in a similar way in both accounts? Any ideas? Nathan? One, one question I kind of have along that line is, is it just showing what the human response is to this type of situation? Uh, yes, I think that's part of it. Um, I was just reading something this week, uh, this idea that, and I don't think it's changed much, but in the ancient world, they viewed men as somewhat unable to express deep emotions. And we might say the same thing today. Uh, but women were viewed as having more emotional depth to draw from. And so, uh, for instance, if, if a man showed emotion, it was because he somehow had more emotional power than the ordinary man, if that makes sense. So in this sense, yes, using Mary and Mary shows the depth of human emotion involved. Because we don't see that. For, for instance, in chapter 20, I, I did think about this as I was working through it. You never really get an emotional reaction from Peter or John. They, they, there may be statements about they see it, they believe, but you don't really get an emotional reaction per se. It's Mary who has the emotional reaction. Now, that's not to say that they never show emotions. Obviously, uh, Peter weeps bitterly after he denies Christ uh, in several accounts of his betrayal. But by and large, it's, it's often women that express that emotional power of the scene. And so, yes, I think it, it does draw on that a little bit. Other thoughts? Might it contribute also to their apparent leadership in faith, having more faith or having faith that leads um, even ahead of the men and they come first? Yes, I, I think so. And I think this is, again, tied to the fact that in first century Judaism, women would be marginalized. They wouldn't be allowed to stand trial. But in the gospel accounts, which gives it, I think, the ring of authenticity, they are very key witnesses to what happens, both on a smaller scale with Lazarus, because Mar Mary and Martha are related to him, but now in a greater sense, with Jesus' resurrection, it's, it's very compelling that the first person he appears to is Mary, a woman. If, if it were true that the apostles were uh, whitewashing this history and rewriting it centuries later, they would give themselves the preeminence, but here it's Joseph and Nicodemus, it's the women, it's all the, the marginalized, quote unquote, who are the key witnesses to Jesus. All right, so yes. Terry? It's about too with when the first Mary was anointing Jesus with her hair, and then she was anointing Jesus with her hair. He said that this will always be recorded about her. And then the second Mary was coming, as I understand, with more spices and stuff to anoint the body again and then she right. didn't see him. So I just feel like these Marys are always ready to believe the next the word God has shined the next light. And so yeah. Yeah, th that's, that's true. I think they're both uh, important witnesses. They're devoted to Christ in a way that even the, the apostles don't seem to be sometimes. They, they seem very thick-headed. But these women support Jesus out of their own means, as the other gospel writers tell us, and they're very committed. They're devoted to him. 
And so, yes, they seem to grasp certain things that escape the normal apostles. Yeah, Kyle, we just studied this just a little bit in our Bible study, and one of the things that stood out, stood out is that the, um, in Luke 24, 11, when the women came back and told the disciples what they had just seen, they said these, their words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying was not just true of the culture today, it was true of Jesus' own disciples. They, right. they didn't respect the mindset either. Right. So. Right. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, and that's something else I wanted to bring out, just that Jesus, I think in this whole episode, is showing that reality has altered. And that is to say, a new order has dawned. Because Jesus here affirms the dignity of Mary. First century Judaism would have marginalized her and discredited her, but Jesus shows that he values her. And if anything, it affirms her dignity, I think, in her position as a disciple of Jesus Christ, as a follower of Christ. All right, so good thoughts. Well, let me just close by pointing out a few uh, key things about this episode with Mary Magdalene. Um, one thing to point out is you'll notice that when she finally looks inside, verse 12, she sees two angels there. Now, all the gospel writers have angels as part of the story, but they all seem to function in different ways. And if anything, here in John, they seem to have somewhat of a minor role. What do they do? They simply ask her, why are you weeping? Remember, the, the term woman here really accorded more respect in this context than it might come across in English. It might be better to say, ma'am, why are you weeping? Okay, so their role here seems to be simply to ask Mary, why are you weeping? Kind of an, almost a rebuke to her in some way. Now, let me, let me just mention, some have said that John, in giving us the positioning of the angels, is drawing thoughts from the Old Testament. Now, I think this might be reading too much into it, but uh, some have suggested that the angels here are positioned at the head and the foot of where Jesus lay, much as the cherubim would have been positioned at the Ark of the Covenant. So, in other words, if you're familiar with how the tabernacle and the temple were constructed, there was a, a special spot in the heart of the temple or tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And behind this veil, there was the Ark of the Covenant where the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod and other things were stored. And so no one could go in there except the high priest once a year. And this was viewed as God's footstool. He was thought to, to live in this place. The temple was God's house in, in a really compelling sort of way. And he reigned there, and the ark with, was his footstool. Now, And some have gone, gone so far as to see about 15 other connections between the two. Um, to me, it seemed a little far-fetched to draw that explicit of a connection. But I will say this. It does at least seem to suggest this has become sacred ground where Jesus was and where he rose from the dead is attended by angels. And so now it, it seems as if they're, Mary's looking into something that is holy, a new holy of holies, if you will, where Jesus has risen from the dead. All right, and then what, it's interesting. Uh, she seems to maybe hear a sound. Some think that maybe the angels motion, but at, at any point she turns around and she sees this man. She thinks it's the gardener. Now again, John loves to keep drawing in this garden imagery, right? We, we saw this earlier that he seems to be connecting it back to the Garden of Eden, I think, and that Jesus is bringing in a new order, if you will. He's, he's the new Adam. So she thinks it's the gardener. He talks to her, and then uh, she talks back, and then verse 16, he says to her, Mary. He just says one word, and what happens? She realizes it's Jesus. Now, many have drawn, I think, important connections here to John 10. In John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And he also said this, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. In verse 4, he says, the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And I think perhaps we have echoes here that Jesus is the true shepherd the sheep hear his voice and know them. He calls them by name. All right, and then 
Lastly, let me just deal with this, this question of why Jesus says, do not cling to me. Some wonder why does Jesus seem to rebuke Mary and say, don't hold on to me or cling to me in verse 17. And Jesus adds a reason. He says, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Uh, any thoughts? Why does Jesus say to Mary, don't keep holding on to me? What was it about his ascension that would have uh, precluded her from doing this? Any thoughts? The Holy Spirit. Okay. When he ascended, the Holy Spirit came. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's precisely the point. That is to say, in Jesus' mind, everything now has been set in motion for him to go to the Father. And John, the writer here, is, I think, calling the farewell discourse to mind. If you remember, in John 14 to 16, on the night before Jesus dies, he has his disciples, the 11, in the upper room, and he gives them the most extended teaching, really, in the Gospel of John. And he makes several references to the Spirit. He says in 1426, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. In 1526, he says, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, he will bear witness about me. And then this, I think, may be the most compelling. He says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, why do I, do I, do I think this connection is important? I mentioned before that Mary and Thomas are very important episodes in this. But if you'll notice, they're framing something in the middle. Verses 19 through 23. Verses 19 through 23, I think, are the climax of chapter 20. And that is where Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of question about what that means, and we'll talk about that next time. Are, are they really getting the fullness of the Spirit, or is this really uh, just a precursor of what's going to happen? So we'll talk a little bit about this next time. But in any event, that seems to be the, the, where John is going. Mary and Thomas are framing this central story, this episode, where Jesus provides the Spirit. And it is a reminder of the farewell discourse that Jesus has to ascend because he's going to give the Spirit. So now is not the time for clinging, it's the time for commissioning that the apostles are to be given the Spirit so that they can go into all the world and preach the gospel. But one other thing, a significant change has also occurred with Jesus' relationship to the apostles. What does he say in verse 17? Don't cling to me, I have not yet ascended, but do what? Go to my brothers. This is the first time in the Gospel of John that Jesus calls the disciples his brothers. Now some say, well, maybe this is just Jesus' real brothers, but that would seem to be at odds with what we know already of the brothers. Throughout the Gospel, they are unbelievers. So it would seem to suggest here that Jesus is saying, the disciples are now my brothers. It's my Father and your Father, my God and your God. The relationship has changed. A new order has dawned. And so Jesus says, go to my brothers and tell them. They are now part of my family because I am the first precursor, the, the, the prelude of what everyone will be. In other words, Jesus in his resurrection, the second Adam, is a foretaste of what all of us will experience if we place our faith in Christ as part of his family, his brothers. And so the relationship has changed. All right, so uh, we, we've seen how Jesus rises from the dead and that this radically changes everything. And so next week we'll look at how he appears to the disciples and specifically what Thomas does as the counterpart to Mary Magdalene. All right, as we close, any final thoughts, questions, observations? All right, well, I trust this is an encouragement as we think about the significance of Jesus' resurrection, that he has conquered death. Our Savior has conquered death for all time, and he even lives today. He's reigning at the right hand of God. <clears throat> he intercedes for us. And so our 
our foretaste of glory came to fruition in Jesus Christ. He's the second Adam, and so we look to him as our Savior, as the pre-runner pre to what all of us will experience in Christ. All right, so let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful for the power of this narrative as we think about the significance of the resurrection. This is not just a, an anomaly, but this is the, the beginning of a new humanity, which you are creating in Christ Jesus. We pray, Lord, that this gospel message, this good news of what Christ has done would penetrate our community. We pray that it would penetrate our own hearts, that we would understand and know. And I pray that you would uh, just bless everyone who is here this morning. I pray that we might grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and in our walk with him. And I pray that we might bring him glory and honor as we serve him. We thank you for your grace, which is evident. We know that grace and truth come through Christ, and we thank you that he's extended that to us as well. We pray now, Lord, for your blessing upon the remainder of this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.